So, everybody's settling in. Can you hear me well? This works? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, as a Berliner, I have access to an almost unlimited supply of Club Mate, but I must say I really like these drinks as well. They're interesting. Um, I think there are probably at least 12 to 15 kinds of different kinds of Mate in Berlin, but they're now also mixing it with banana, which I do not like. Uh, I do like the ginger ale variation. <laughs> Anyhow, let's talk about clouds. Um, a little bit about me, so I live in Berlin. Uh, and I do like Club Mate. I wasn't born there though, but my dad was. It's a farm in the southwest of the Netherlands. Uh, my wife still calls me farm boy sometimes. Uh, I come from a small island, I mean, a uh, village, about 3,000 people where I grew up. So after that, when I went to study in the big city that was Utrecht with 100,000 people, I thought that was quite the upgrade. I really appreciated it. Uh, until I met my wife in Brazil, well, we met in Finland, but she's Brazilian and she lived in a 1 million people plus city. And of course, there's Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo there with both 20 million. So, you know, for her that wasn't really big, so we moved to Berlin where she felt a little more at home. Which is a great place to live. Uh, so open source has been a hobby for me. I studied psychology, and after that I did some business consulting, you know, Lean Six Sigma, all that boring stuff. Um, but then open source in my free time, I mean, I was fascinated by this whole thing of people working together in their free time, and of course I quickly became one of these idiots as well. In the KD community where I did marketing, promo, helping people out, writing articles about what was going on, first blogs, then articles. Um, closer, better, better this way? All right. Anyway, at some point, uh, Susan Linux hired me to become community manager for OpenSUSE. That was around 2010. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. Uh, then I worked at OwnCloud, and now NextCloud. Now about me, let's talk about this. Now, um, the Talk to description talked a little bit about uh, cloud stuff. Um, I'm gonna take a, a very simple definition of it. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, then I'm gonna talk about file sync and share, which is one of the things in there. And um, what's next? If you have questions, please just interrupt me. You can wave, and there's a microphone somewhere that I can give to you, but I can also repeat the question. I, I prefer to be interrupted, to be honest. Then again, I know you're probably all going to be way too polite to do that, so I can live with questions afterwards as well, don't worry. Right, clouds. So I don't think I need to tell you what is awesome about the clouds. Um, these big companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Oracle, many others, they've built really amazing services for all of us. Right? YouTube, Gmail, face Facebook, Dropbox, Tumblr. Uh, we put all our data online because it's awesome. Now, these services are often easy to use, they, they can be accessed everywhere, it's easy to share with other people. Um, if you lose your phone, you know, you just log in on another phone and you have all your data again. Uh, this, this kind of stuff is of course amazing, it's very useful, we use it every day, it's a good reason for all this stuff. It works, it has made our lives both a little more busy but also a lot more productive, which might compensate. And of course you can also, you know, shoot pictures of your food and play games on these devices as well. And it's all free or very cheap. Now the free part of course might also bring us to the next uh, thing, the, the bad side of it, a concern perhaps. I mean it's been said, you know, um, that if it's free then you're not a customer, you're a product. And there's some truth to that. It's, it's not the entire picture I think, but there's certainly something to say for it. So you got to ask yourself these questions. Yeah. Where is my stuff? And who can get at it? And what are they using it for? And generally speaking, these, these questions aren't really answered very well. And if they are, you usually wouldn't be happy with it. So the reason these questions are important is privacy. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of talk, uh, a lot of my time on privacy, because I think a lot of you are probably aware of the concept and the issues with it. But a very simple thing, uh, often you hear like, I have nothing to hide. And this gets to, to the core of privacy, or actually not privacy, because this is not the point of privacy, having something to hide. Uh, first of all, you have no idea what you should be hiding, because there are so many rules and regulations all around you that you're breaking the law many times a day, 
without knowing it. Yeah, they've, they've done uh, some studies and they think that the average internet user is breaking the law multiple times per hour. And that's a normal user, just doing normal stuff. Right? There are so many rules, especially copyright is very complex, but also in real life, you break the law very often. I mean, you do know you have to cross a street properly straight, right? And if there is a, a zebra close by, etc. These are thing, moments when you break the law. And you do this a lot, and you probably think, well, what's the problem with that? They're tiny things, nobody bothers with it. That's true. But the thing is, of course, if somebody wants to bother with it, and they would know all of it, they could. They can't right now because they don't know it, as of today. But the direction we're taking with privacy is that at some point they can know all this stuff. Now, there's, there's an example of the, the protests uh, against the Keystone Pipeline in the US where a journalist was locked up for trespassing. Now, walking over somebody else's land, not technically, yes, that might be illegal, but it's a freaking journalist. They're following a crowd of people reporting on it. Uh, it is obvious that that law was used to lock up the journalist because she was annoying, not because of the breaking of the law itself. It had nothing to do with that. Now, to some degree, there there is some use for laws like that. For example, in Washington State, no, Washington, uh, Washington D.C., there is a law against being smelly, which seems pretty ridiculous, right? I mean, if you use too much perfume or something. No, it's, it's for the police to allow them to basically take homeless people away when they're causing trouble. Yeah, I mean, if, if homeless people are being allowed Somewhere that might not exactly be against the law, but the whole neighborhood has a problem with it. I mean, people need to sleep is it, if it's late at night. So you have a number of these laws that are kind of arbitrary, but it can be used for purposes like that. Now, it's kind of okay that, that sometimes law officers have some freedom to, to apply these things. Yeah? That's not necessarily a bad thing. But obviously, it can also be used to stop journalists, to stop freedom of speech, to stop legitimate protests. And that's where it becomes a problem. So, imagine perfect law enforcement. That would mean that, well, things like revolutions, you know, that have resulted in pretty much every country in the world would never have happened, including, by the way, the United States, for example. Yeah, because you, you can't plan a revolution if you have perfect law control. Um, law. Right, because everything is being controlled, and, and if the police would know everything about you, there's no way to conspire and overthrow a bloody government. Yeah, if you get a dictatorship, it's going to stay a dictatorship until the end of time. There's no way to do something about it. I mean, perfect, perfect policing would be a huge problem for society, because once something bad gets in there, it, it'll never get out again. again. Yeah, if you have laws against uh, gay relationships, and you just catch every single gay person every time, that wouldn't be good. And we certainly wouldn't get, you know, legal gay marriage at some point. Right? You, you get no more change in society. Anything that is bad today will be bad until the end of times. Because nobody can break the law and figure out that, oh, it's not so bad to smoke a joint. There's no problem with that. Now you, you, you get completely stuck. So privacy, just for that alone, is already really important. You, you need to break the law sometimes. It's okay, it's normal, it's healthy in a society. Yeah. And last but not least, I mean, privacy is a basic thing. I mean, there's a reason you close a toilet door, as they often say. And, and as normal human beings, we have a need for this. Uh, I mean, take, take the average person's Facebook account. Yeah? How well does it reflect their real life? I mean, think about this for a second. Right? You take a picture on the evening of a party, not of the results the next morning, do you? Why, why is that? Well, as people, we have a need to portray a certain image of ourselves, right? The, the, the faithful husband, the, the hardworking employee, the, the, the party animal, whatever. We were lying. It's, it's part of us, it, it's part of identity, it, it's part of people. You, you always feel a need to portray a certain image. I mean, why do you wear the clothes you wear? You're trying to portray a certain image. Now, without privacy, we're effectively all naked. At least to the people who have access to this data. Now, to Facebook, you're kind of naked. Because they can analyze from this data stuff that you probably don't even know about yourself. And they've done a number of studies of what data you can get out of Facebook, and it's quite scary about being gay or not. 
for example, which here is just fine, but there are countries where you can get killed for that. And that means that if the government demands from Facebook certain data and then analyzes it on that way and uses that to find out who is gay and isn't and then acts on that, well, there are some Russian states at the moment where you can get murdered for that. You do get murdered for that, and not just in Russia. So privacy is pretty damn important. I won't make a point too much more. Um, there's just one last thing I want to point out here, and that is that if privacy gets eroded, who gets hurt? You have government uh, officials and politicians arguing that we should get rid of, of perfect encryption. So if they would indeed outlaw encryption, for who would that be a problem? Would it be a problem for government uh, officials who are corrupt? They're part of the system, they can protect themselves. It wouldn't do anything against corruption. And what about um, organized crime, big criminal organizations? They have the resources to use encryption, whether it's legal or not. I mean, they're doing illegal stuff anyway, they don't care. So no, it wouldn't do anything about organized crime. Terrorism, same story. Yeah, so if you introduce laws to, to limit privacy, to do something about corruption, organized crime, or terrorism, you're lying. Those are not the reasons to do it, because it's not going to help against those things. It might stop a local person doing something bad, but it won't stop organizations and, and in general, the real problems in our society, like big companies, who sometimes act suspiciously much like criminal organizations. And none of those would have a problem with it. It's only normal people, and of course journalists who are annoying, uh, local activists. You know, if you join the protest uh, to keep a certain park close to your home open, then you're on the list from then on. Uh, that's the kind of stuff where it's a problem. So what do we do about it? Uh, that's of course where it gets interesting. So, in the early days of the internet, the, the idea of the internet was to build a network that was decentralized and federalized. Federated, not federalized. So the idea was that if a part of the internet would break down, it would still work. Uh, damage would be routed around. Even censorship, to some degree, is being routed around by the internet. It's meant to be a, a robust structure. Sadly, since then, things have changed. Uh, as of today, the internet isn't as decentralized as it was designed to be. Because if Facebook goes down, if Twitter goes down, if GitHub goes down, you know, well, if Facebook goes down, the productivity goes up, but if GitHub goes down, the productivity goes down a lot. Uh, a while ago, there was an interruption in Amazon, and, you know, half the internet stopped working. So, the, these things are pointing to a problem, right? We've been centralizing everything again. There's just a small number of companies, a couple of dozen, that is running, I don't know, 80-90% of the page views on the internet, and, and most of the stuff that's happening, and that's, well, that's a problem. So, if we want a solution for privacy and security, we need a solution that's decentralized. Because any central place means that the government can just go there and shut it down. And it's quite easy to shut Facebook out in the country, because, you know, facebook.com and there you go. But everybody could run their own Facebook, it would become a lot harder. And this goes for chat, and this goes for lots of technologies. So any kind of solution needs to be secure, but it also needs to be decentralized and, and hard to shut down. And open source, I think, for this crowd is something I don't need to explain the benefits of that, obviously. And a solution to this needs to be open source. Now, I already explained what decentralization is good for, so I'll uh, just move on. But the point is, of course, if you have 10,000 places where you can find credit card information, it becomes a lot less interesting to try and hack it than when it is all in one place. Uh, it, it makes the value of information for a hacker also simply less. The pure fact that it's decentralized makes it less interesting for somebody to try and hack it. That in itself is already a value. And backdoors come up a lot. Well, let's not go there because that's not a conversation I think many of you don't need to be introduced to again. So, the cloud is awesome, but it's a problem for privacy, and privacy is important. So we roughly know what we need, right? Something that you own, something that's decentralized, something that's secure, 
uh, something that focuses on giving you control of your data. Now, there are multiple solutions in multiple areas, but obviously I'm here to talk about one of them. Next cloud. And at the core of it is a technology that is to sync and share data. Uh, so think about an open source, decentralized, self-hosted Dropbox, or Google Drive, or many of these other big services that do similar things. It takes the boxes that we just discussed and more, uh, and it's easy to use, which for us is really important. Uh, design is a big part of it, that's of course why you also had a designer talk here earlier who has also been active in the Nextcloud community. Um, because we think that if you're not as easy to use as the big players, then normal people aren't going to use your technology. Yeah, I mean, think of PGP, which is very secure and nobody uses it, or almost nobody, because it's just horrible in terms of usability. That's a problem. It means you've developed something, but you're not making much of an impact with it. At least not as much as you need to. I mean, think services like Dropbox have hundreds and hundreds of millions of users. So if you make something that is used by even a few million of users, which we're happy about, but it's, it's not enough. We're, as a project, we're definitely much more ambitious than a few million users. We want hundreds of millions of users. So it's a cross-platform solution. Um, Nextcloud itself runs on Unix systems, Linux, LAMP stack, typically, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Uh, but, it's cross, but the applications are cross-platform, so have Windows, Linux, and Mac desktop clients, Android, iOS, and a lot of third-party applications. And one of the nice things about it, actually I should stay here, is that uh, a lot of people, they have data in multiple places. So you have maybe a NAS, or you have an FTP drive at university. Um, as a company, uh, you probably have like, like Samba or uh, Windows Network Share or technologies like that. So Nextcloud can act as a gateway to those other storage technologies. So you essentially hook your existing storage into Nextcloud, and from there you can access it and use it wherever you go. You can share it, and it doesn't matter that it's on the Windows Network Drive, or even on Dropbox or Google Drive. And, well, it has all these fancy features on top of that, and one nice one there is encryption. Um, Obviously, it uses encryption and it communicates between your phone and your server. But it also has this nice uh, storage encryption feature where if you do have 50 gigabyte of free space at Dropbox, you can actually use it if you use the encryption. Every file that is stored on Dropbox is first encrypted by the Nextcloud server. And because your keys never leave the Nextcloud server, the only thing Google and whoever subpoenas the data from Google gets is encrypted files. Have fun with it. I think that's one of the nicest features if you put it all together. So you can do all the stuff eh, if, 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 you had, uh, if you went to a wedding and people ask, okay, can we share the pictures? You can send a public link with a password and expiration date. People can then upload the images there. And you can make a nice collage out of it or something. Uh, all these features are there. Um, and even, by the way, and this is nice, obviously, I mentioned federated. So federated means that multiple, well, email is a good example. I might uh, want to spend a few words on explaining this. So federation means that um, multiple different systems act as one, kind of. If you are on Google Mail, you can send an email to somebody who is on a Yahoo email server. The fact that this person is on Google and the other is on Yahoo doesn't matter. While if you're on Telegram and I'm on Signal, we can't talk to each other. So Telegram and Signal are not, not federated, while email is federated. So similarly, Nextcloud servers are federated. If you run a Nextcloud server, I run a Nextcloud server, I can share a file to you and you'll get a notification on your Nextcloud server that says, hey, this guy from that Nextcloud server just shared a file with you. Do you accept it or not? And then you can see it. Yes. But this only works for two Nextcloud servers, not two different, like, because you had WebDAV there, mm -hmm. how does it work? So the question that is asked is, does this work only between Nextcloud servers or also others? So it works with others, well, first of all, OwnCloud, of course, which Nextcloud is a fork of. But we worked with Pydeo, which is another open source file sync and share solution. We worked with them to implement it. So uh, the sharing protocol is an open source protocol. It's mostly WebDAV based and a couple of REST calls to, to control the sharing itself. It's pretty simple. It's um, uh, I think it's called the open, 
Open Cloud Mesh API. Uh, so we certainly welcome other projects to implement it as well, and one of them already has. So yeah, we want this to be cross cloud, not just between next clouds, ideally. And it's easy to deploy. Uh, a lot of people aren't big fans of one language or another. And uh, well, I give you every complaint you have about PHP, you're totally right. But the thing is, of course, there are hundreds of thousands of people who know the language, which makes it um, easy to get contributors. And there are, um, well, almost unlimited places where you can run it. Plus that every administrator knows how to run it, how to scale it, how to secure it. Uh, which makes these choices obvious for us back in 2010 when the project was started and still today. And it doesn't mean, of course, you can't have it very secure. Security is pretty much our highest priority as a project because in the end, if it's not secure, privacy doesn't mean anything. Uh, you, you can put stuff in your own server, but if it's easy to hack it, then uh, you didn't really gain any, anything with that. So we work uh, according to really strict security policies, have everything reviewed, we do developer training at our conferences around security. We review everything specifically for security. We run security scans. We have a security bug bounty program. If you find a security bug in Nextcloud, you can get up to 5,000 euros from us. So we really put in a lot of effort to keep it as secure as is uh, humanly possible. And it's very extensible. Because there's more than file sync and share, and Nextcloud is built as an app platform. We have over 50 maintained apps at the moment that add different kinds of external storage, that add different authentication mechanisms, uh, LDAP, OpenID, um, uh, you name it. Um, but also things like calendar, contact, email, music player, video player, and functionality like that. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can find in our app store. Uh, we'll get to some examples later. And last but not least, as I've said many times, it's open source. Fully AGPL, no shenanigans, just purely, completely open. Now, development happens on GitHub, um, anybody can get involved. Of course, if you want to run this as a company and you have 20,000 users that need to get their work done, it would be stupid not to get a support contract. We offer those too. That's what pays my bills, as well as those of many of my fellow developers. Nextcloud GmbH, German company, that offers long-term support as well as uh, support contracts for enterprises that use this. So, going back in time a little bit, a little bit of history. So, all this started in 2010. Uh, San Diego, Frank Karnicek, the founder of OwnCloud, uh, gave a talk about essentially the problems that I've described earlier, as well as potential solutions, but of course at that point there wasn't really a good solution. And he said, we should start a project to build one. And it was a KD project in the beginning. Um, and well, we started to build and develop uh, the project that, uh, well, I just presented to you. Um, in 2011, the first meeting took place. That's the picture on the top right, five people. On the left there is Frank. And in uh, 2016 at the conference, we had uh, the same people still. They're still active in the project, which I think is really cool. Seven years later, so many people still uh, around. Um, well, in, uh, I have, have to go back here. In 2012, uh, Frank started a company with a bunch of external investors to essentially hire people and work on AGPL code. Now, the business model of the company was to, well, was the open core model. If you're not familiar with the model, the idea is that the core of the product is completely open but every developer has to assign their copyright to the company, so the company can make proprietary add-ons on top of it. Now, the amount of open versus closed you do can vary. Some open core projects have very little open and it's mostly closed. Other projects do it the other way around. I think OnCloud did a pretty good job. Most of it was open, but all real enterprise functionality was closed. And this model worked reasonably well. Um, in 2014, I very arrogantly put that date in there because that's when I joined. <laughs> so that only matters to me. Um, but at that point, um, I was working at SUSE and I had a discussion with Frank about becoming community manager for OwnCloud. And I asked a couple of my friends what they thought about OwnCloud and about joining the company. And one of them was Georg Grief. He's the um, founder of the Free Software Foundation Europe. And he had a big concern with regards to the business model of the company as well as how it was funded. 
So he said, look, the thing is, the company owns the code, it owns the product, it, it controls the community, it's a single company community, no other company can really easily contribute because of this ownership thing. And he says, second of all, the venture capital owners in the US, <coughs> they in turn own the company. That's a pretty nasty setup that can go really wrong. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's a point. So I brought it up in one of the conversations I had with Frank about joining the company. I said, what do you think? And he said, well, he's right. That's true. He said, but uh, the thing is, it's all in GPL what we write. So if Oracle, as many of you probably know, is a destroyer of open source, if Oracle <laughs> buys own cloud, I will fork. And the others will join me. And the only thing we've lost then is all these years, uh, of, the only thing we've lost is the company, but all the code, all the work that we've done, it's still there. And we can just continue, maybe even start a new company. Well, that obviously brings us to uh, 2016, because that's more or less what happened. Um, in June 2nd, we announced Nextcloud as a new company. Uh, I don't want to go long into why we quit, why we left. I mean, obviously, I gave a big hint just now, so there you go. And um, I can add to that, the way I see it, the way we see it is, look, we fired management and continued. Um, management happened to have owned the trademarks, so there's now still an own cloud, but we continued. It's the same crew, the same people who wrote the code and are just continuing its development. Pretty much the whole community has joined us um, and many customers are following as well. We're profitable already, we're doing well, we're over 30 people, so we're good. And that's pretty much all I want to say on this subject. Uh, we did our first release on June 14, next lab 9. Uh, with it came also the Android app, completely done by volunteers, and that continued to be completely a volunteer project until um, February of this year that we hired people. The volunteers just did an amazing job, better than it had been done all the years before at OwnCloud, if you ask me. Uh, it's a pretty awesome example of the power of community. Um, for iOS, we uh, partnered with a company that had built already a uh, back then own cloud compatible alternative client for iOS. Um, initially, the application continued to be proprietary, but we worked with them, and in February of this year, they open sourced the iOS client completely, including an exception for the Apple Store. So that means it really GPL except that the Apple Store doesn't allow pure GPL applications in there, so you have to add an exception for that. Which we did, we worked with the FSFE on that to have the right exception text in there. Which I'm also very proud of, I mean we can even now help open source other projects um, thanks to what we're doing. Nextcloud 10 came in August. Essentially Nextcloud 10 was based on OwnCloud 9.1, which was a feature freeze when we left. So this was a matter of stabilizing it and publishing it. Our first real release was um, Nextcloud 11, which was pretty much all about security and scalability. So making it a lot faster, especially in large instances for large customers and large uh, providers as well. And making it uh, well, a lot more secure to so introduce brute force protection to factor authentication and lots of other features that keep it safe. And Nextcloud 12 is coming next month and I'm going to talk about that a bit later. I'll skip this. Well, that's part of our team, but this was the picture was taken when we were at uh, 20 people, and now over 30. And this was a picture of the community, but that's also grown to over 100. It doesn't really fit anymore, so I'll just keep the pictures. And we did the next Cloud conference in Berlin, um, uh, August, September last year. Yeah, September. That was fun. So let's talk about what comes next. So. We've built a file sync and share solution, which is also an app platform, so it does a couple of other things that are really cool. And um, as far as I'm concerned, for a normal user, provided you can run a server or pay for one at a provider, the problem of syncing and sharing files is really solved. Nextcloud has this just down. It's easy to use, it works really well, it's e it has clients for every platform that do everything you need. The basic functionality is there. But today, people expect a little more. The thing is, if somebody shares a file with you, 
you want to know more, you want to know some context, you want to say now why it was shared, what they expect from you, what you can do with it. So you, you want to have communication and you want to work together. Yeah. So this is going to be the focus for Nextcloud 12 and it has been the focus already for a while for us. We introduced Collabora online uh, earlier uh, at the end of last year where you can real-time edit documents, think Google Docs or Office 365. And uh, we've worked on making that those features better and better integrated in Nextcloud 12. Um, we made the sharing more flexible. So for example, and in Nextcloud um, 11, you could make a share for someone. You could either share to other users on your Nextcloud. You could share to users on other Nextclouds or Pydeos or own cloud servers. And you could create a public link that you could email to people. Now in 12, you can also just enter people's email address and as many as you want, they will each get a private public link. Forgive me the uh, wording of that. Um, and each of these links you can separately configure in terms of access rights. So you can send a link to someone where they can only upload files to you, and they can't even see the files that are in there, with an expiration date for next month. And then you can give three other people each a link where they can see and edit the files, but they have to enter a password first with no expiration date. So it's really flexible to you know, work with other people. You can just give everyone exactly the kind of access that they need. And also internally now, if you share a file internally, you can put an expiration date on it, uh, which wasn't possible before. I think that's also nice. No password, but that's kind of silly, of course. You're already logged in. So that makes no sense. So another feature that we introduced in Nextcloud 11 was audio video calls. So you have built in an app, uh, audio video calls app, where you can call somebody via WebRTC um, in the browser or on their phone even. It works quite well in, uh, on some phones and not on others still. We we'll work on apps for that as well. And in Nextcloud 12, we make this more integrated. So wherever you are in the user interface, you can and you see an avatar of somebody because they commented on the file, or because you share the file with them or they share the file with you, you can click the avatar and you can send them an email or chat with them or give them a call just right from there. So make, make the integration more seamless. And you can also do screen sharing now with uh, Nextcloud 12, which of course for collaboration is quite nice as well. And last but not least, we introduced push notifications. Now if you add all of this up, you get to a scenario where, you know, somebody sends you a file, your phone pings and says, oh, you got, a, no, you got a, a file shared. You open the file and you think, oh, what am I supposed to do with this? So you click on the avatar and you call them and then their phone rings because of the push notification again. They pick up and you discuss the file while you collaboratively work on it. Uh, all of these features are falling into place now. And it's really cool because this even can work. We're not done yet with this federation part, but we also want to call these calls to be federated. So that you can call somebody on another server. And at that point we have a fully decentralized real-time phone system. And nobody else has that. That's pretty cool, I think. Well, you have some technologies for that, but have it so nice integrated with file sync and share. This, this is really a next thing um, that we're working on. So the push notifications are coming in 12. Um, the, the avatar clicking is coming in 12. The federation of calls is not coming in 12 yet. We're working on it still. Then there's a whole bunch of other features around collaboration. Uh, you can have guests. Uh, you can create your own groups of people. Um, a bunch of authentication mechanisms. Of course, the basics are there as well. We have a lot of security work. We have another more scalability and performance work. Um, we add rate limiting to the brute force protection. Um, upgrading is going more smooth, so if you're currently an admin of a Nextcloud server, you will probably be very happy to hear that you will no longer have to re-enable the apps after an update. Yay. A lot of people found that quite annoying, including myself. So that is fixed, because what we do now is we try to upgrade the app, um, and then if it breaks, we just disable it again. This wasn't possible before because of PHP 5, which can't catch uh, an exception, like an app breaking. So if this would happen on a Nextcloud server, and uh, you upgrade, one of these apps has a bug, 
your server breaks, everything is broken, your whole upgrade is screwed up, there's nothing you can do. We thought it would be a little better to then add the pain for each of the admins to have to re-enable the apps by hand. But now we can have our cake and eat it too. So long live the progress of technology. So yeah, there's PHP 7.1 support, um, language support for external sites and SharePoint integration because yes, companies, they need that. Now, I made a demo, or at least I, I made a setup of Nextcloud 12, but that's just me. I'm not saying this is me, just <laughs> thought it would be nice to have a monkey picture there. So I'm going to try and give a demo, however, we're not even in beta yet. That means what I've done is I've taken a snapshot of master, merged a couple of branches that weren't done yet because I wanted to show those features, and then discover, of course, that the whole thing broke, and then try to kind of halfway have it sort of running. So this is one of the worst kind of demos, obviously, you can do. On the other hand, some of the stuff works, and that's still nice. So. Um, after I've tempered your expectations a little bit, I think I'm, um, I'm open for giving this a real try. So let me see how well this will go. Um, Alright, so let's first log in as admin. Welcome, here we are. So one of the changes is that we've now put the menu here on top. Uh, if, if we're all about collaboration and getting your stuff done in this one interface and not just about syncing and sharing files, we should actually make these apps a little more prominent. They used to be in a menu, but now they're always on top there. And if you switch between an application, for example, go to your contacts, then you, know, you can just see and switch between these different um, groups and areas. Um, we have a whole, kind of, a whole bunch of different applications. This is a Kanban board application which is still very uh, work in progress. Calendar, you just saw the contacts app. Um, this is the video calls app which is sadly not working because uh, it stops at this point. Um, that's what you get when you have a uh, you know, check out of master. I can show you uh, our new apps interface so you can install apps there now. I'll put in this. As you see, this is one of these mobile optimized interfaces that on the desktop doesn't look that awesome. In my opinion, I have to complain to the designers about this. But uh, you have a list of your apps, and if you have an internet connection, which I don't at the moment, you will also see more apps. Let me enable the network and see if that will um, show up, then I can show that then later. Uh, but yeah, you can easily enable disable apps. Um, so, in terms of new features, well, as you see, this is an alpha, as in just a direct get checkout. Um, so, one thing we've done, uh, so Nextcloud 11 introduced brute force protection, and what it effectively does is if somebody tries to guess your password just as many times as is needed, I mean, this is a computer, right? You can try thousands of passwords per second. Well, not with this, because after that you've tried 10 times and got it wrong, it will slow down the rate at which you can retry, and at some point you can only try once a minute. Now once a minute still might sound very fast, and yes, for a human that wouldn't be a big problem, but of course for a computer that means you can only do 60 times a second, uh, a minute, an hour. You can only do 60 times an hour, which is nothing compared to hundreds of thousands of times it could normally try in an hour. And if you have a even remotely complex password, of course 60 times an hour will not allow a computer to break it. Uh, what we've done is we, um, we expanded brute force and now as developer you can add the brute force protection to your application as well. And we wrote a little app where you can whitelist certain ranges so you can actually, well, not brute force protect in these areas. For example, if you want to run a test or do something else, um, then you can uh, protect like that. Um, all right, let's see if the network connection works now. We go to the um, apps again. And the whole list now shows up. All right, so, well, there's the brute force settings. You see I have enabled this. I can disable it, and then it'll just disappear. You have two-factor authentication. These two I've installed as well. You have also SSO, SAML, and other apps. 
there's already quite a bunch of apps actually available for this release, which is really cool. Um, there's a uh, full stack search, which we introduced in 11, of course, also available for 12. Uh, Collabora Online. For that, you need to have a separate server running with Collabora, though, so that takes a bit of work to set that up for a normal home user. Um, there's a video calls app. Um, yeah, and a calendar contact, mail, and other applications like that. So, that's our app store. Uh, and, and it's very easy to, to install an application because you don't need to do anything to install it, right? If I click on enable, it's now being downloaded from the server, installed and enabled. We try to hide like details like it's on a server somewhere else from the user as much as possible. And you see that it then appears here and now I can switch to the app. See if it works. Woohoo! It doesn't create problems. Okay. So, that was um, the admin overview. So, let's log out and, and see what a normal user sees. Um, I'm going with our kitten lover here. So, we shared some files. Here are puppies shared by Dogfan. And you can see that here's a menu where you, can have, where you have all your contacts. You can email them. And, and this is where my merging of pull requests didn't go far enough, clearly. Um, once we're done with the final release, you will also be able to call somebody here or start a chat or other things. Um, but I already broke enough, so I kept it at mail. There's something here. It's just a mail tool right now. Um, but if I click here on the icon, you will see the same menu, although you also see we found a bug, which I already reported. Uh, and we can share with more people. So we can say, well, um, let's share this with Hidden Kitten. Now there are two ways in which you can share. The top one here is remote. This means that this is a share to the user hidden at cloud.kittens.com. In other words, another Nextcloud or Pileo server. And then the user will get a pop-up. If we try this, we should get a Warning that you know sharing puppies failed because there is no such server, which makes sense because of course I just made that address up. So now that does not work. What does work? Um, let me delete it. So is of course to send an email, which sends the personalized email that I mentioned earlier. Um, ah, this file is already shared. All right, that was then already done by Dogfan separately, and it keeps track of that. Fascinating. I didn't even know that. Which file does it mean here? Because it's so the folder that I click here, it's puppies. Ah. And uh, you see here, yeah. puppies. And this is what we're sharing here. So um, let's share maybe important data that was shared to us by the admin here, which I can email. There it does work, as you can see. And then we can share this with Hidden Kitten, whom it also was already. Really? All right, I will just make something up. I email it to myself. There we go, just by email. And well, this time, no warnings. You see, I can edit the file. If you go in here, you can say, well, you can edit, actually, you can only upload files. Um, you can uh, add password protection and then you know, make up a nice password, uh, set an expiration date or not. Um, and you can unshare it again, if you like. So what this does is that it um, gives you a upload only link. I'm going to give, show that as an example here. We share the file via a link. I could only also open my email and look up, but I am too lazy for that. So secure drop. Um, then we open a porn window and paste the URL. And this is all you will see. Irrespective of the content of the folder, you can only upload files there and not see the content. So that's the idea of secure drop. Uh, for a company, of course, this is very useful. If your customers need to upload files to you, you have multiple customers, you can give them the same link. Or a different link via the email thing, or a unique link to uh, this folder. And then you can put a 
expiration date on it, and then they can all upload files to you in that folder, but they can't see each other's files, which is sometimes quite important, of course, for the security and privacy for your customers. And now it's done again. So that's pretty much the stuff I could um, get working on such a relatively short note. Um, so I will try not to bother you too much with, with more or less broken stuff and see if I can continue the presentation. Um, let me see. Well, there's our lovely monkey again. So, well, here are screenshots of the things I just showed you, so I don't need to repeat this, obviously, um, because these things you've seen, and they're secure drop. So, I already talked a little bit about the security part of things, about the whitelisting. Another thing that we added there is rate limiting. Um, it's kind of similar, except that uh, it's used um, internally. For example, the number of um, remote shares you can receive from other servers in a certain time, which can essentially, it's more of like a spam protection, but then on a very technical level, and developers can use this as well. There are some examples in the documentation coming with 12. Uh, we also made a bunch of changes to two-factor authentication. We now support hardware keys, so you can have a UB key and use that to uh, a second factor to authenticate the next cloud. Um, we support OAuth and a bunch of other authentication mechanisms if you want. There's a number of apps that add uh, functionality. There's a Circles app. Uh, it's the one on the bottom, but it's not very readable. You can, as a user, you can, can, can create groups of your own users again. So it's, it's kind of like a functionality where you do with your contacts, but then other people on your cloud. If you have a lot of colleagues you work with in different groups, different teams, this can be useful to organize and plan uh, that collaboration. Um, the impersonate app is for the admin. He can impersonate the user, so if you as a user have a problem, and uh, you say, look, I don't know how to do this, and the admin then can click and then can see um, and impersonate that user, you, and then see what the problem is. Uh, and the guests app allows you to create, well, a guest account for people, so you can share files with them, but they can't really do, put their own files on it, it's just a very basic account. Now, uh, next level 11 already introduced monitoring, so you can follow what's happening in your server, number of users logged in, the number of shares, uh, things like that. Um, you have features like file access control, so if you're a system administrator, you can create rules, for example, say, okay, you know, uh, I want the people in the uh, HR department to not be able to accidentally share XLS sheets, XLS X, I think, Excel sheets, or, of course, uh, open document variation of that. I don't want them to accidentally share those outside of the organization. So you make a rule that says, okay, you know, peop um, files of that mime type and, and people uh, the share, sharing person is in the HR department, then, you know, this is not accessible from outside. And if somebody then, if they create a share link and they send it to someone from outside of, for example, an IP range, then that person will simply get a warning that says, look, this file access is blocked, you don't have access to this. So you can use this to enforce the rules that your company has around data privacy, data security, maybe government regulation, things like that. As an admin, you can put these rules in. Because the, the, the core concept of Nextcloud is to make sharing as easy as possible. So you do and share all the time everything. And that, of course, for a lot of admins, sounds really scary because they are used to having this directory structure. You know, like the, the, the company Samba Share or the NFS or whatever it is, the Windows Network Drive, which has a very rigid structure. And you have access to this subfolder, but not to that, and a read only there. You don't really have much of that in Nextcloud. I mean, you have fine-grained permissions to some degree, but the way people are kind of encouraged to use it is to just share and reshare and just, yeah. You know. And that's nice because it increases productivity, but of course, if you have very strict regulations, you need certain techniques to control this more. And that's what these apps are for, automated tagging does something similar. Are we there? We're approaching, approaching. plus five minutes, so. All right. Um, well, you also have retention and, and features like that. Um, all right, I will skip this then, and I have last a few things. 
So part of our mission to give everybody control back over their data um, also bumped into the point that running a server is pretty hard. Running Nextcloud is simple and using the software is also very easy. But of course you can only run Nextcloud if you already have a server and running a server for all of you who do it, you know this is not a trivial thing. It's actually quite hard, certainly if you want to do it secure. Now there are Nextcloud providers, there's a few dozen companies that offer you hosted Nextcloud. Now on one hand, it's a step forward from you know having your data at Google or, or, or Facebook. On the other hand, it's still not in your own home and in your own control. So that's why we worked with Western Digital and Canonical to create an Nextcloud box, which is literally a box where you can put all your stuff on. In there is a one terabyte hard drive, and you bring your own Pi, connect it, um, put in the SD card that comes with it, connect it to the local network and to power, and you have Nextcloud. It then appears on your local network under the address nextcloud.local, and you can access it. You need to do a little more magic to open a port in your firewall and get it accessible from the outside, but it already lowers the bar significantly. And because of Ubuntu's snappy uh, technology, it updates itself automatically, so you're effectively always on the latest version and as secure as is possible. So this is pretty nice, and it's cheap and you can order it online if you're interested. Um, this is not a money thing for either of all three of us. So if you want to support Nextcloud, I'll buy a Nextcloud box. Sorry, that doesn't really work because we don't make a dime on it. But um, nonetheless, we're very happy that we sold a few thousand because it's really a cool way for people to get control over their data. What comes in the box is the pie and the... What comes in the box? Uh, in the box comes uh, the box itself. Plus the hard drive and cables, uh, charger and the SD card, but not a Pi. It's a bring your own Pi thing. So we have at the moment SD card images for Pi 2 and Pi 3, and the box is hardware compatible with Odroid C2 because I'm a fan. Uh, I think Odroid C2 is way better hardware for this. It's just that everybody knows the Pi, so that's better from a well marketing perspective. I have to think of that too. Um, and also we don't have an OS for the Odroid. But you can install your own Debian or, or you know whatever OS you want. Uh, so if, if you're a bit more of a techie and you want to experiment with something like this, I would order a box because it's really good value for money, and then buy an Outroid with it and play with that because in terms of performance, that's an uh, order of magnitude better than a Pi. There are some other hardware devices with Nextcloud on it. Uh, on the left is SimCloud. On the right, uh, Spreetme. That was a project from our par like parent company kind of, or technically we're a spin-off of another company that made a Spreet box which has uh, secure audio video calls plus Nextcloud on it uh, but it has a plus thousand euro price tag so it's meant for small businesses like um, uh, lawyers for example who really <coughs> need this utmost security for communication with their clients uh, so it also has droid ish hardware but has a specially designed security module and other stuff that gets the price tag up a little bit. Um, but quite interesting stuff. That's it then. Where and how to get started. I have flyers and stickers out there. If you want more please tell me because I have more with me. I don't want to fly them back to Berlin so please take them. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask now or come to me later, of course, that's fine too. Yes, we're on a pretty tight schedule, but let's do a question while we change speakers. Uh, I can't see Lev, but I guess he's here somewhere. Uh, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to do a big backup and put it on Amazon or something, so if your box breaks, you can just easily turnkey just... Well, you then of course have to make sure you made a backup of the keys themselves as well. Yeah, exactly. I would suggest to do that, yeah. yeah. At the moment there's not really an app for that. Uh, right now we leave backup to users themselves. Okay. However, we're actually, actually Frank himself is working on a backup app. Nice. So with Nextcloud 12 comes a, comes a basic app that you, you point it to a location and it makes a backup of itself there. Excellent. So we're making progress on that uh, in that area. 
Well, yeah, be careful because this is um, mm -hmm. something you still need to do yourself. Certainly with the next level box, right? There's one hard drive, no RAID, mm -hmm. which is technically possible. We designed the box to fit two hard drives if, pos if you want. Uh, but the software doesn't do it automatically. If you connect a second hard drive, nothing happens. Right. You'd have to do that yourself. Any more questions? The next cloud should show something um, uh, more advantage than the ordinary NAS driver. Uh, for example, uh, can I have a couple of next, these uh, next, uh, next cloud uh, devices and uh, want them to really replicate each other? For example, having a backup of each other on certain places. Yeah, so, so technically that's possible, but it's not a functionality we've built into Nextcloud itself. Okay. Our federation feature, where you can communicate between Nextclouds, leaves the data where it is. If I share a file with you, yes. you can access it on your Nextcloud, but what happens underneath is that whenever you look at a file, copy it, uh, edit it, your server asks it from my server. And the reason we do that is because that means I stay in control of my file. Yeah, and, and yeah. Sorry? It's not distributed. No, it's not distributed, no, exactly. That's, it, it's kind of a control thing at the moment. However, obviously, you can use a distributed file system, which is what big companies would use anyway for something like this. Okay. Yeah. So I had to be a bit rude and let the man on, but all of you know how Jost looks, and you'll probably be in the lobby, so you can hijack him there. Uh, so, so once again, thank you. Mute. Thank you.